My name is Aaron Shafawalaf. I moved to Utah in December of 2005 to do evangelism to the Mormon people. And <clears throat> I've been here for, gosh, it's been 14, 15 years now. And uh, we've been doing evangelistic work on the street since 2007 regularly. And I've been a part of some church plants. And now I'm heading off to Kansas City to go to seminary. One of the things I'd like to give counsel for to my brothers in Utah is that of having an, a regular evangelistic fellowship, which I take to mean a group of brothers that meet perhaps weekly or on a, on a regular basis and that do evangelism together in a, an adequately foot-trafficked area where they can intersect all sorts of people. Uh, and having a regular location and having a regular group and having uh, frequency uh, and a schedule doing that um, provides an amazing context for doing evangelism together. It sounds like at different points in history, and it'll probably happen again in the future, there will be a, an ostensible conflict portrayed between stranger evangelism and relational evangelism. I take relational evangelism to be an ongoing interaction in a relational context where you have a high probability of having continued relationship with someone with. So this is not a stranger you meet on the bus. Uh, this is more like a neighbor. Uh, it's more like a family member. Stranger evangelism is initiating new interactions with people and having meaningful short-term conversations with the hope of follow-up, but with the likelihood of never seeing them again. And I think both are really important. And I think it's good for each church to have perhaps a few persons that excel even in stranger evangelism, as well as relational evangelism. I think they're complementary, and uh, they help accentuate different aspects of the gospel. Um, there's certain ways you can show gentleness in a relationship that you can't show on the street in a 10-minute conversation. And there's a kind of directness and overtness and a boldness and an urgency that you can communicate um, in a short-term conversation that a lot of people are, um, that a lot of people have a hard time doing with the casual, long-term, gentle nature of a relational context. So it seems like God has given us both, and the benefits of doing stranger evangelism far outweigh the benefits, uh, far outweigh the, any cost or benefits of not doing it. We have a mandate from Jesus to reach all of creation, all of the nations, every tribe, tongue, and nation. And there are only so many Christians in Utah. So it seems like we should think about two points of optimism. One is, even through relational evangelism, we can meet, uh, we, can, we can reach a lot of people through the multiplicative effect of disciples making disciples making disciples. And we should uh, utilize the context God has given us for um, having conversations with people that have... That, that perhaps don't have touch points for other Christian relationships. Perhaps the stranger you're speaking to does have a Christian touch point, a relational touch point, but those Christians have been, um, they've not been able to share their faith for whatever context they're in, uh, in, an, in an initiative way, or they've been scared to do that, or they, the, the relationship has sort of smoothed over and they've gone so far where the, the Christian's like, I've gone years without sharing the gospel, I feel awkward sharing it now. A lot of people say, well, if I have a relationship with someone, then it can win me the right to share the gospel with them, and it'll be more effective. That, that can be true that can, in certain contexts, but in a lot of relationships, the urgency is lost, the comfort level of sharing the gospel is, it gets more awkward for some people to share. So uh, with strangers, also we can be overt. 
You know, um, when people try to conflate the two categories of long-term relational and short-term stranger evangelism, sometimes they'll be stealthy or covert um, or happenstance about the way they share the gospel. When it comes to short-term stranger evangelism, I mean, you, you, might, you might have been working a nine-to-five job all week long. And you might be in a certain kind of family context where your, your older parents and, you know, when you, when you do your family dinners um, with the in-laws, it, it, there might be, there might be a, a social dynamic there where you're not welcomed to share the gospel. You might be in a work context where it's just inappropriate to prick the consciences of your um, coworkers in such a way that detracts from the immediate mission of accomplishing a work task or maintaining sort of the, the atmosphere, the ethos of, of, of the work. With, a, with, with stranger evangelism, this is your time to be straightforward, overt, direct, bold. A lot of us Christians, we've got the gospel like fire in our bones. We've got to get it out. We want to share it. And so God has given us public sidewalks in the U.S. And he has given us free speech. We already have that naturally as a God-given right, but legally it's been confirmed and protected. So let's use it. Uh, We don't have to be um, we don't have to fit a certain mold of what that looks like on YouTube in the most dramatic fashion. We can just hit the streets, hand out tracks, have conversations, and share the gospel. First things first, you need to look out for a cultural epicenter hotspot where there's foot traffic and scope out the fishing holes. So that means doing some experimental evangelism where you're, you're hitting the street and you're getting a gauge for the foot traffic and you're taking note of what events are happening. For us on Thursday nights at Temple Square, it was the choir practice. So we had um, skiers and convention goers and locals and um, tourists that would come. And it was an amazing epicenter of foot traffic for different kinds of people. There will be parades, um, musical events, parties, uh, downtown festivals, uh, evangelists. <clears throat> I like to say we're like mosquitoes. We get really excited about large groups of people, <laughs> but more benevolent than that. Um, so we should take note of, of situations where we can plant ourselves at a street corner, for, for example, with tracks in our hands and overtly try to initiate conversations. It's important when you show up to pray. Uh, it might, you might be alone. Hopefully you have a brother. Pray together before you start. Close your eyes, you know, bow your heads and pray that God would give you at least one good conversation. Pray that God would keep away troublemakers, people who are in the flesh, people who disrupt, people who um, stimulate your, provoke your flesh, um, people who are arrogant and who are hard of heart. And, you know, God might call you to call, he might call you to talk to people like that at times. But the aim is to talk to people who have a willingness to have a conversation, at least some measure of humility to listen and exchange ideas. Pray that God would restrain your flesh that you would be humble and gentle. Pray that God would give you boldness, that he would help you work hard. Paul said things like, I, work, I worked harder than anyone, but it was not me. It was the God working through me. It was the grace of God working through me. Um, pray that God would help you increase the bond of friendship and fellowship with the brothers that you're working with. If you're among evangelists, you're more often than not going to be working with people who um, more so have eccentric personalities and they're more engaging. Typically, you're going to evangelism attracts attracts certain kinds of people sometimes that um, you know just have personalities that might be difficult. So pray that God would give you a love and affection and patience for other brothers. Pray that God would help you have your rough edges smoothed over by hanging around other Christians that are mature. Pray for increased 
uh, peace on the streets. And then prayed for opportunities. Say, Lord, please send out people that you need, that you want us to talk to, that, that need, uh, that need a message. Pray that God would give uh, you the right person for you to talk to that night. And so when you're done praying, work. And I mean, work hard. Don't be casual about it. Be direct and overt. Take the initiative. <clears throat> Take the risk. Get rejected. Uh, but pray that God would provide. Um, and when you're done, celebrate. In prayer again, Lord, you lavished us with opportunities to share your gospel. Tonight happened according to your will. Tonight happened according to your providential sovereign decree. Um, you loved us tonight. You, you, you were able, you, you, you gave me a conversation with this guy or this gal, and I'm, I'm thankful I got to share the gospel. So just erupt in thanksgiving. Use the opportunity to sing, either before or after. Um, I know a lot of y'all are at churches where you've got big bands and you've got strong instruments and big amplifiers. If you're one for a cappella singing, um, where there's no instruments, or maybe somebody just brings a, a guitar and does some light strumming, this is a great opportunity to sing the songs that you can do so uh, spontaneously or ad hoc. Um, maybe prepare a song or two, and when you pray as a part of the debriefing, uh, start, if, it, if this is awkward up front, just punch through the awkwardness and do it. It's worth it. it it'll become normal to sing together. We're, we're commanded in Colossians 3 to sing to one another. Sing to one another. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's, it's uh, to the Lord, yet to, to one another. It's, it's worshipful of God and yet encouraging of one another. So, you know, get all your terrible male voices that, <laughs> that the, the guys who said, I can't sing. Have, you know, get them singing. And um, it'll lift your spirits and um, how appropriate, how, how utterly appropriate in the work of evangelism to overflow in worship, to take the activity of gospel preaching and to, to enjoy it, to, to really just love the gospel, enjoy sharing the gospel, love the person of Jesus, the word of God, the gospel of grace. How appropriate to end that, to tip it off with, should nothing of our efforts stand, and, and just to sing. One funny thing about doing evangelism in a group together is that you're socializing and you're typically talking about life, uh, doctrine, whatever's on your mind. Evangelists, we love to talk about theology and church and evangelism. And, but when you're together and you're, and you're working hard to do evangelism, you'll see someone walking by and you're there to do evangelism. So one of the fun habits we evangelists have is abrupt walkaways from other believers. Abruptly exiting a, an existing conversation, mid-sentence if necessary, to go hand out a tract to someone you just caught in the corner of your eye passing by. So um, if you have to be a little goofy about that, if you have to be a little awkward about that, just normalize it. It's normal. We're going to have a lot of time to spend together. We're here to share the gospel. So it's okay to be uh, abrupt in your exits from conversations. It might take you a while to get an evangelistic fellowship going. It might just be you for a while. It's good to have one other brother, <laughs> at least. Otherwise, it's a lonely affair. It's good to have a brother with you. But it might take years of tilling soil and regularity and c making connections to grow that to something more substantial, a critical mass, enough to saturate a street corner. Um, so just keep at it, but you know, don't, uh, don't underestimate the connections God has given you to galvanize. Use social media. Um, use your, your friend list, friends list on Facebook. Tell, tell people about, you know, you're meeting there, you're, you're inviting people. Um, meet people and invite them out and, and, and make it uh, hospitable. 
You don't need to do anything. Just show up and shadow. Just pray. Just be with us. Just pray with us. Just sing with us. Just be around you. It's fun. You, you, can, you can talk with other brothers. And if you want to talk about how your week's going with another brother, he'd be glad to listen to you. So, you know, if, if somebody is in your church and you just need friends and they don't want to do evangelism, maybe invite them out. It's a great place to meet friends. So um, be, be, be about the work of galvanizing and using that as a social touch point, an insertion point, an on-ramp for friendship making among believers. Galvanize, invite, get to know the evangelistic people in the different churches in the valley and invite them out. Talk to the pastors, say, hey, do you have anybody in your church that has an, an, atch, an itch to scratch for evangelism? Somebody who's, who's bent toward evangelism. If you have anybody like that, would you just please send them our way? We try to keep it pretty uh, accessible and accommodate the different sort of the collective sensibilities of, of evangelists from different churches and work together and do mostly conversational evangelism. We try to be dignified and mature and we make mistakes, we repent, we grow, we share the gospel together. We would love to take you know, the few guys in your church or gals and, and, and just incorporate them into the community and uh, indirectly serve your church that way. So galvanize, get people together. And I, I think you'll find that there's believers that are eager to do evangelism, but they don't know where to start. They don't know where to show up. They don't know, they, they, they're like, I, I will do this. I've watched Ray Comfort. I've listened to Todd Friel. I've seen Tony Miano. I've, I, you know, I've, I've seen examples of this on YouTube. I've seen Jeff Durbin. I, I could never do that. That's beyond me. That's, that's hard. Um, I, I, but I want to do evangelism. I, I just don't know where. So people just need to know a place to show up. They just need to know a place and a time to show up. And so get that out and, and, and let people um, know where they can show up and galvanize. And um, if you're going to be a salesman, be a salesman for the benefits of joining that group. Like, hey, it's, it's fun. It's, it's a good place to meet friends in, in Christ and grow in your evangelism. The regularity is important. So we don't do evangelism in the winter. Some brothers actually still can go out and do that. But one reason why is the people we might intersect on the street during the winter, they're not as willing to stop and talk to us. The other reason is just cold. And it's maybe a time of, of uh, rest and relaxation or just you know thinking about other evangelistic opportunities. So, but the other three seasons we've been downtown. And the regularity has been helpful. It's not that every week we want to be there with all the same passion. Sometimes we're feeling under the weather. Sometimes we're tired. We're exhausted. We're busy. We have a hundred things on our to-do list. There's stress in the home. There's things to take care of. Um, you've been working hard and you just want to watch a show or read a book. The regularity of a scheduling the time, it, it helps you. You might show up and be grumpy. Okay, let's do it again. And then 15 minutes later, you're like, I am so glad I came. I've never come and regretted it. I've always been happy I came. I've always been happier for having done it. The Lord has always blessed us. He's always lavished us with fellowship and conversations. And that might not be in your face. That might be out of sight, out of mind. But once you're there and you participate in it, God blesses you. The other perk of regularity is that if you can spread the word, hey, this group meets on this day at this time on this corner. And so what that does is it helps the people you recommend come recommend others that come. So we had a brother come Thursday who had heard through the grapevine that we met, and so he joined us. And it, it wasn't a direct invitation from any of us, it was, it was through other people, because they knew we would be there. They knew that there was regularity. So it, it, it becomes more approachable, accessible to local Christians when, when they know you'll be there, when, when it's faithful. It's also helpful because there's unbelievers there who know you're there. So you're not there for drama. I get a little uncomfortable with some people that show up at General Conference in Salt Lake City twice a year. And it's frustrating because we're there every Thursday 
faithfully. We're not there, I wouldn't say this about 90% of the people that come, but we're not there for the cameras, we're not there for the crowds, we're not there for the drama, we're not there for the, you know, the excitement. So when you're regular, you establish a presence. And your presence uh, becomes more welcoming to the community. We have students in Provo, for example, who might say, oh, I saw you there last week, but I didn't stop and talk. And I figured I'd talk with you this time. Um, there's also a sense of safety, like, oh, you're not crazy. Like, I've seen you there for a year. And um, people who are erratic, uh, people who are unstable, they tend not to be regular. They tend to just be all over the place. You've been there every Thursday for six months. So you're more trustworthy. You're like, okay, they're there to have conversations. They're not there just to shake the beehive and run away. They're there and they want to have, con- they're, they're welcoming us to have conversations with us. So um, what comes to mind connected to this is our relationship with the security at Temple Square, the, the Temple Square security. Um, Years ago, over a decade ago, they were more rude, they were more intrusive, uh, there was more of a hostile relationship. They would even come out to the sidewalk and at times insert themselves into existing evangelistic conversations between a believer and an unbeliever. Um, and now this is like 2000, this is um, 2006, I think, 2007 was when I started doing this more regularly. And there was a summer I came out even before that. But our regular presence gave us a context for having more relationships with, and they're, and they're very, you know, somewhat superficial relationships with the security guards at Temple Square. Um, in your context, uh, elsewhere, it might be just people who are managing businesses nearby or the police. Well, your regularity helps you establish some relationships with them, and they, you get to know their names, you get to ask about their families. They get to feel your personalities out. They get to get a sense that you're, um, you're safe. Um, they get a sense of, you know, even if you have disagreements about, you know, what you're willing to do and they w- that they wish you wouldn't, um, you just kind of get to evolve into a peaceful coexistence. And I think God blesses that. And we've been able to share the gospel with quite a few LDS security guards, even this past Thursday. Um, I think by having a, a safe, regular, patterned presence there. It also helps with uh, your spouse. So if you've um, got a schedule, you, you need to take care of your wife and your kids. You can't neglect uh, your family or your job. If you're neglecting your basic duties, say, say as a husband or a father, then your friends in Christ should tell you to go home. You shouldn't be out there if you're neglecting your basic responsibilities. This isn't a game. You need to be faithful in your locale and with your inner response, your your immediate responsibilities that God's given you. But if you've got a schedule where you say, okay, Thursday nights, I'm going to do evangelism. I think that's more helpful with your spouse and your kids because there's an expect, okay, this is what dad does on Thursday nights. And your wife can schedule around that, or she can, she can work with that. Like she can help you make that workable. She can make dinner early that day. Um, and it just it settles into a pattern. I think, you know, evangelism, when you're, when you're in Utah and you're eager to do evangelism, some people have a tough time sort of juggling all those things. Well, scheduling it out and having a regular pattern, um, it's really helpful. A regular evangelistic fellowship gives you a context for making the best friends in the whole world. What better context, besides the local church, is there for making friends in the Lord, working together, sweating together? When we do evangelism, we find a lot of value in doing carpools. So if it logistically makes sense for your group, I would recommend not seeing the carpool as utilitarian for the transportation, merely. I would see it as an opportunity to get some dudes, maybe some ladies in a car together, or multiple cars, and prep 
and connect, get to know each other, encourage each other. Maybe someone's had a hard week. So it becomes its own kind of fellowship. That carpool has become a very sweet, very sweet part of the week for me. I've had drama, conflict, sustained conflict with only a few people that I can think of throughout the years. And in every single case, it's with somebody that doesn't have a healthy relationship with their local church. So a a regular evangelistic fellowship is not a substitute for the church. A church is a body of believers that has its own governance, its own regular gathering. It's where people have their uh, Prime, uh, primary local Christian community. It's where, some, it's where the, the body of believers submits themselves under accountable and trustworthy elders. It's where the people are held accountable. It's where they are either implicitly or hopefully explicitly covenanting together in community. Um, they are committed to one another, living out the one another's of the Christian life. They're living in the open in some ways before other believers. Um, subject to the encouragement and correction of other local believers who know your, know your life. It's where you might have a squad of brothers that, that you're close to, that pray for you, that encourage you, that know you. So if you're not a part of a local church, you probably shouldn't be part of a, local, a regular, regular evangelistic fellowship, which is parachurch. Uh, parachurch ministry is meant to serve and complement the local church. It grows out of believers already having healthy relationships with a local church, ideally. So um, if you've got a brother that is joining your evangelistic group, you can be gentle. You don't need to to jump on somebody harshly the first that you meet them. But the trajectory of your interactions should be that of, uh, and, and if it's between brothers, spurring them to join a local church and be in healthy relationship. Uh, there's no room in the Christian life for having perfectionistic standards for a church. You find a reasonably faithful, trustworthy church with good leaders, with gospel preaching. You might have a list of things that you wish they would do that they don't. Just find a good, faithful, local church that works well for your family, that feeds the gospel of your family, and then treat your evangelistic fellowship as secondary. When we've had conflict with people, it's with people who don't have any accountability. It's, I, I you know, in the Christian life, I, I should be able to say, in the Matthew 18 escalating confrontation protocol, I should be able at some point to say, I think at this point I would love to take a brother and speak to you and your elders or an elder. I'd, I'd like to have a, a larger conversation with the people that you're accountable to in your local church community. And when you meet somebody and they're, and they're causing problems and they don't have that relationship, there's, what recourse do you have? That's really difficult. So we like to be very upfront and early in, you know, it's even in the socializing process, what church do you go to? If they're not a part of a church, you immediately point them to good churches in the valley um, and if they're not a part of that, then they're, at some point you've got to start, re, you know, chiding as a brother, rebuking, uh, reproving as a brother, and telling them, brother, you shouldn't be here. Uh, the same goes for if whether they're, you know, neglecting family responsibilities, marriage, work. Um, it, it, this, this might seem orthogonal to evangelism. How does this relate? It relates because you want stable, trustworthy guys that are going to go to battle with you and be trustworthy. Um, So you need to encourage them to get a a job that is providing steady income where they're taking care of their spouse and their kids, not neglecting their kids. Um, They've got their house in order and they have the at least informal informal blessing of their elders and their community to be out here on the streets with us. And if somebody does cause conflict and they're refusing to be part of a local church, it's difficult because it's a parachurch con- context, but you've got to figure out a way to communicate and, and, and do so in unity with the other brothers that you're not letting this person be counted as a f- brother in good standing and they're not welcome to be there on, on account of 
of their neglecting their greater responsibilities. It's important for evangelists to have a healthy criteria for satisfaction and joy. And so uh, go into the work of evangelism with, say, something like this. If God would just give me one good conversation tonight, I'm going to be happy. If I can be around brothers who are doing evangelism together, I'm going to be happy. If I can hear the gospel even out of my own lips to an unwilling set of ears, I'm going to be happy. I got to share the gospel. So evangelists are easily pleased. How did your night go? My wife says, I got to share the gospel with someone. I got to uh, walk through the storyline of the Bible, or I got to summarize quickly the gospel. Um, if, you, if you're easily thankful, uh, you will be happier. And you'll find that God will multiply your joys because he lavishes uh, blessing on you. So it's time to start conversations. How do you do that? Well, I'll just tell you how we typically do. First, we feel naked without a tract in our hand. <clears throat> you can do it without a tract in your hand, but it's pretty natural for us to have something we can hand out. So even if they don't want to talk, um, they have something in their hands, perhaps. Also, it's something physical. I, I can extend my hand, and it, it's, a, it's a prompt. So a lot of what we do on the street is handing out a tract, engaging body language. And the body language either says, get away from me, I don't want to talk to you, I'm busy, this is scary, you know, this kind of thing. So we're trying to be uh, respectful and kind and approachable. And if someone doesn't look like they want to talk, then you're, you're there to, to intersect foot traffic. There's other people. You can pray for them. Even if they're rude to you, occasionally, don't return evil for evil. Don't return rude for rude. Let them have the last word. You know, it's rare, but um, most people in Utah are pretty chill. Most people are just super sweet and super polite. In fact, they're conflict avoidant. So <laughs> it's just... They, they're like, they, they don't want trouble. Um, but most of them have been on missions before. Most of them knows what, they know what it's like to do religious proselytism. Um, so they're pretty respectful, pretty kind. Well, when we hit on a tract, and if, even if there's a little bit of a notion that they might be willing to talk, they slow down a little bit, for example. We might then ask, how are you? Or um, uh, can I give you one? Uh, where are you from? Uh, can I explain uh, what, what the tract says? Um, what's your religious background? Um, hi, I, I'm a Christian talking to people about Jesus. Would you mind if I spoke to you for a few minutes? That might sound goofy coming out of your lips. You're like, I would never say that. That just sounds so overt. It seems so straightforward. You, you learn to be more straightforward, even if it feels a little goofy. Be a little goofy for Jesus. Take the risk. The, the pathway that we've used for conversation starters is to gauge the body language, do a, you know, 15, 30 seconds of just polite introductions. And then at that point, something pretty straightforward. Hi, I'm a born again, <clears throat> I'm a born again Christian, and we come here on you know, Thursday nights to talk about Jesus to people. Uh, do you have a few minutes to talk? I'd love to talk with you. Or, um, have you ever uh, met a born-again Christian before? <laughs> oh, here, here's, some, here's something I like to ask. Uh, where are you from? So I'm from Utah County. Cool. Um, have you been on a mission before? <clears throat> Where'd you go to high school? And with those, que with those questions, I can ask, were you ever able on your mission, for example, to talk to a born-again Christian about faith and doctrine and theology and God and the Bible. Were you ever able to talk to an evangelical or a born-again Christian or a Protestant about um, faith? Or uh, if it's with respect for their upbringing, did you ever have any born-again Christian friends? Uh, were you ever able to have religious conversations with them? What did you talk about? My, my agenda here is to see if they've already had existing faith conversations, and then to help them recall them, and then to build on those. I don't want to throw my brothers under the bus who have had those existing conversations. I want to build on them. So I can ask things like, well, what did you talk about? And the, 
the helpful thing here is if, if my conversation partner puts a topic, he or she introduces a topic, puts something on the table that I have not yet introduced, I can work with that. They might say, well, we talked about the Trinity, or we talked about prophets, we talked about you know, continuing revelation or the Book of Mormon. That gives me something to talk about. Um, and I can still be overt. I, I, this isn't sly or covert. I'm here to do evangelism. I'm here to talk about faith. Another question we like to ask is, on your mission or in your relationships, have you ever heard the gospel explained before by a born-again Christian? If they say yes, I can say, well, what did they say? And I can help them perhaps recount or summarize in their own understanding what the gospel is from an evangelical perspective. If they uh, get it right, I can build on that. If they get it wrong, I can say, hmm, yeah, I don't think that's quite how I understand it, and go from there. If they say they've never heard it explained before, which is often the case. If I ask, have you ever heard the gospel explained before from a born-again Christian? And they say no. Two things. One is I can have my heart provoked in a good way. Wow, I'm talking to someone who has never heard the gospel clearly articulated before by a born-again Christian. Wow. Let that melt my heart for a second. I'm in America, and I'm talking to somebody who's never had that touch point before. Then I can ask, would you mind if I did? I, just this past Thursday, I did this with a lady named Tia. Um, she said, well, I always run through on Thursday nights, and I never talk to y'all, but I figure I run through all the time, so I, I should just give you a hearing once. And so I ended up asking her, have you ever heard the gospel explained before by a born-again Christian or an evangelical? She said, no. Would you mind if I did? Sometimes I say, it might only take me a few minutes. So what I did is I just started with creation, and I worked through the promise of, of the offspring that would someday crush Satan. And we, we worked up to Jesus in just a few minutes, and then we talked about the cross and the payment for sins and the gospel of grace, and the resurrection, and the free gift of forgiveness and eternal life for those who trust in him, and then the return of Christ and the judgment that's coming in heaven and hell. And then we went from there to talking about uh, false prophets, false gospels, and the need for repentance away from that to the true gospel and the true Jesus. And she listened. And she had a few questions, a few comments. Um, I tried to make it more con conversational. But that, that's, a, that's a pretty common path, is asking people if they've ever heard the gospel explained before, whether they've heard, whether they've had a faith conversation with a Christian before. And if a topic comes up, uh, Rich taught me this, he likes to ask, have you ever heard that topic before explained uh, by a born-again Christian. Uh, what's your understanding of how mainstream Christianity sees that? What's your view of that? So that opens up a lot of avenues. Starting conversations takes work, uh, but it's more simple than you think. You don't need to be a car salesman. You just need to be overt. You don't need to be a people person. You don't need to be an extrovert. Uh, you don't need to be skilled. You just need to be genuine. If you ever find yourself stuck and you're like, I have no idea what to say right now, there are some good questions to have on your tool belt that are pretty simple. Uh, I like to ask, can you explain that more? Help me understand that better. Greg Kolkow taught me this. How did you come to that conclusion? What convinced you of that? Can you walk me through the story of how you came to be convinced of that? Um, tell me more about that. Hmm. Or if you're stuck because you just don't know the answer, you could say, would you mind if I get your contact info? I'm not sure. I, I don't want to speak ad hoc and speak irresponsibly to that. I, I don't have a developed opinion about that. I, I'm not, I don't have an intelligent answer to that. 
I'd like to think about that some more and research that. Would you mind if we followed up? Or you can grab a brother. Uh, I was talking with a Roman Catholic on Thursday night about praying to Mary. And I had a brother named Jim feet away talking to somebody else, but there was a small group, so I figured I could corral him in. So I, I tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, Jim, I'm talking to uh, this, this man over here. Would you mind joining us? I had a question for you. So if you're, if you're new, if you, you're shadowing or if you're just getting your feet wet and you're like, I don't know what I'd do if I got asked a question and I don't know the answer, you can just tap a brother, you get his help. And uh, one really neat thing about that is when you are challenged with things like that, you go home and you read your Bible. It energizes your Bible study because you don't want to be ill-equipped. You want to be thoughtful, you want to be prepared, and you're just curious. Irrespective of, of the evangelism sometimes, you're just curious about the truth and about what the scriptures say. So use that process of ignorance and learning and uh, back and forth and being stuck. Um, it'll make you a better Christian, a better church member, a better an, an evangelist. You, if you stick with that for years, it grows. It, it grow, I mean, you grow. You grow through that. One really easy way to keep the peace in conversational evangelism is to slow down. That's it. Just slow down. More pauses. More pauses give your conversation port, uh, partner more insertion points to interject, to participate in the dialogue. It helps you be more thoughtful about the terms you're using you're not dumping a lot of information on someone that's hard to think through. You're, you're being careful with your words. You're letting a lot slide. They might, they might have said 10 things that you want to respond to, but you just pick one and you slow down and you focus. Uh, maybe you think about the way your shoulders and your feet are planted so that you don't look like you're being aggressive, so that you're being more approachable. Maybe you're using uh, gesticulation a little bit where you're, you're, you're slowly using your fingers and your hands to accentuate what you're saying in a way that's both firm and yet gentle. Uh, maybe you're making a point and then you hand off the baton or the microphone, as it were, to your conversation partner. You say, what do you think? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, how, does that how does that land on you? Like, what, what are you thinking right now? Um, or you can help people fill in the blanks. You can share a Bible verse or a story or a thought and help them participate in the, in the, so the process of the thought. Um, you also can just be comfortable with silence. You don't need to fill in every five-second gap. You can just slow down, learn to listen, Evangelists love to talk, usually. We love to monologue. We have to work hard at listening. And listening's a benefit. We can better understand a person. We can help them feel more respected, more loved. Uh, we can be more careful with our words. So de-escalation is a really important part of evangelism. Not because, every, not because the typical conversation needs de-escalation. Most conversations we have are peaceful, manageable, there's just not an issue. But you're, you do that long enough, week after week, you get into scenarios where you have to learn to keep the peace. So de-escalation is just a good life skill. God will mature you through that. Uh, so being funny, being uh, fun, or being um, polite or cheerful. Another way you can help slow things down, be more polite, respectful, de-escalate, is you can um, ask someone, can I show you this? Oh, I... You know, I have, a, I have a Bible verse in mind. Do you mind if I pulled out my Bible and showed you a Bible verse? That's helpful in Utah. Um, Mormon culture gets scared of people pulling out their Bibles. Um, they're, they're not used to the authoritative appeal to the Word of God. It's not, you know, it's not necessarily welcomed always. So just prefacing that with, hey, can I show you? And when they say, sure. 98% of the time people say, sure, I'm, yeah. So you're getting their permission, so to speak, in a communicative way to open up your Bible and, and, and you could point 
your finger to the verse and read it slowly or have them read it, slow down. And that can make for a great interaction. Um, that doesn't mean you have to, to, to be uh, understated in your, your appeal. It's God's word. It's not merely your perspective. Evangelism is a collection of communicative methods. It's, cl- it's declaring, it's sharing, it's listening, it's rebuking, it's instructing, it's encouraging, it's questioning. So uh, we want to use the whole range of communication. Uh, we want to learn to ask really good questions that provoke thought. So in your preparation or as you're listening to your fellow evangelists work, listen for the questions they're asking that help provoke conversation. Um, Listen for opportunities where you could say something, but instead you are Socratic. You you ask a question to provoke the thought and further the conversation. Sometimes it's appropriate to share. And what I mean by that is it's a gentle, hey, look at this with me. Can I show it to you? Uh, The benefit of that is it's gentle. But uh, Christians don't stay at the level of sharing. We're ambassadors. We have a message based on an authoritative word with a king who has sent us. So there is, in the, in the range or the modes of communication, there's also declaring. Declaring is when you stop using qualifiers like, well, in my perspective, or in our view, or in my position, where you stop needlessly qualifying or softening what you're saying, and you just say it. God says, it's written, thus saith the Lord, in that manner. Well, God's word says, well, it, you know, it just says it right here. He just says it. God commands this. He, he announces this. He declares this. So, so don't be shy. I mean, you, be gentle. Use the different modes of communication God's given you. But you're there to herald God's word. Sometimes we get into bad conversations. Jesus said in Matthew 7, don't throw your pearls before the swine or you'll get trampled. So Jesus is giving you permission here to walk away from bad conversations. If somebody is not humble, they're completely arrogant. They're steamrolling you. Um, they have malice. You are not obligated before Jesus to perpetuate those conversations as long as you can. You're allowed to stop those conversations. And there's a number of ways you can do that. You could say something like, I don't like where this conversation's going. Or you can say, sir, I'd be glad to have a conversation with you, but you're going to have to calm down. You know, I'd be glad to have a friendly, peaceful conversation with you. I don't think this is working out too well. Um, I I don't want to quarrel with you. I don't want to quarrel. I'm okay with debate, if it's friendly, if it's respectful, even if it's spirited, passionate, focused on the truth and scripture. Uh, But I don't want to quarrel. I don't want to quarrel. So uh, uh, maybe maybe, maybe next week, come back and we can talk again. I just don't think right now the, the, the mood or the ethos is good. Sometimes you can end a good, you can end a bad conversation by using rebuke. And uh, rebuke is a New Testament component of Christian communication. Don't be scared of it. Uh, Grow in giving rebukes. There's a way to give a rebuke that honors Jesus, that doesn't stir up uh, quarreling or the flesh. So uh, you don't need to be uh, enraged. You don't need to lose self-control. You can learn to give a pointed, concise rebuke. Sir, you were being arrogant. Sir, you need to repent. Sir, uh, that is inappropriate. Uh, sir, you need to humble yourself. Sir, you could, and you could uh, mingle that with pleading. Sir, that, that is wrong. Uh, sir, you're not behaving yourself. This is, not, this is no way to, to behave in front of your, your, your family like that. And, and then you could walk away. I mean, and if you need to, I mean, walk away. Walk away 20 feet, walk in the other direction, in the conversation. Um, if you prolong a bad conversation, 
nobody wins. God might use it for good. That doesn't mean it was wise on your part. Uh, if, if you protract a, a bad conversation, your flesh is stirred up. You feel gross afterwards. Like you need to take a spiritual shower. Ugh, that was awful. Uh, so don't, um, don't feel bad about using your discernment about character. Um, this person's just trying to waste my time. Walk away from bad conversations. We have a rule among evangelists. It's a, it's a rule of thumb. It's not absolute called the fry your own fish rule. And the basic idea is that a lot of evangelists have a path they're going down in their conversations. So don't be eager to interrupt. Be cautious about interruption. Uh, let someone manage their own conversation. <clears throat> let someone go down the path they want. You might hear a, a seasoned believer listen to someone say five different terrible things and you look at them and they just don't look bothered by it and they're gentle and they're and they ask more questions and you might think well i have an answer to that i have a response to that i have a really urgent message for that well you're not welcomed to interrupt typically it's not appropriate typically for you to interrupt those conversations you can grow to trust your brothers that they're going down a path and they're going to get to the point of it. They're going to show the gospel. They're going to show um, verses from the Bible. They're going to show God's word um, to someone. And they're going to make a point. And to do that, they might have to wade through stuff they have to just let slide. Um, also, uh, evangelists grow to not feel like they have to have an answer to everything. So it might not be important that you're your brother has an answer for everything. Also, let's say you're really experienced. Let's say you've been doing this for a decade and you're with a brother who's there newly. He's fresh, he's green, he's there. You need to let your brothers make mistakes. You need to let them um, have their own conversations. You can use wisdom. There might be a welcomed interruption or a welcomed contribution, but you might preface that by... Um, just gauging the situation if somebody's frantic or urgent, like, help me out. You need to let, you need to be invited into the conversation, typically. So even if somebody's new, you need to let them get their feet wet. Also, God is not in the business of only saving people through seasoned expert evangelists. He loves to communicate his gospel through fumbling, bumbling, non-skilled communicators who barely know the gospel, who barely know their Bible. So when you're listening to a brother fumble through a gospel conversation, but they're, they're essentially sharing the gospel, <clears throat> just pray. Lord, you love to use the weak. You love to use the lowly. You love to use my brothers like this to share the gospel. You don't need me here. I, my expertise is not what saves people. Uh, my polished, prepared answers and my experience isn't what saved, it saves people. So it, an important part of a regular evangelistic fellowship is being welcoming and hospitable to evangelists who are new and who are rough around the edges even. And you can be confident that if they spend enough time with you, they're going to grow and mature. And there's a time for rebuke and debriefing and correction um, sometimes there's even a time for, you know, ad hoc, in the moment, correction. I, I, I don't think that's what it, oh, actually, the Trinity's three persons and one God. <laughs> um, there's, there's a time and a place for that. But um, what's cool about a regular evangelistic fellowship is that it's, it's, it's intended to draw people in from different churches in the valley who um, don't have experienced evangelists. And you want to increase the fellowship across the churches. You want more people involved. So just, just learn to shut up and listen um, and be cautious about interrupting. Now, when we are done for the night, we try to pray together for the people we spoke to. And if you do this long enough, you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna do something that was sinful or unwise. So you're going to be thinking about that a lot 
that week if your conscience is alive. So it's important to let God, to use God's people to correct you. Uh, don't do introspection alone. Debrief. Talk about how things went and receive correction from your brothers. You don't need to agree with everything they say, but let their correction land on you and have its effect on you. Um, there's also a joy in the debrief where, uh, yeah, can you believe what God did tonight? Huh, it's amazing. So ask your brothers at the end of the, t- the time, how were your conversations tonight? Did you have any good conversations tonight? And let them monologue, let them debrief, let them recount uh, the story of how God worked through that conversation. It's pretty cool. Uh, use the carpool again back for debriefing and listen to everyone's night and you will grow together. And where you have been unwise or sinful in your interactions, uh, repent. Don't feel paralyzed. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if you have gotten beyond yourself, if you've thrown your pearls before swine, if you've gotten arrogant, um, if you've retorted in ways that are sinful, um, if you've become impatient, or if you've been a coward, repent. And don't let that guilt sit on you for the rest of the week. Deal with it. Bring it to the cross. Confess it to your brothers. There's no virtue. Well, there's, you know, you're, the virtue of authenticity here isn't what makes you right with God. It's the blood of Jesus. So confess your sins. Look at it straight in the face. Deal with the shame. Swa- you know, swallow it. Bring it to Jesus. Let it be forgiven. It quickly, immediately. God doesn't mean you for, to be, for you to be paralyzed by guilt. He means for you to move on. So be forgiven, be corrected, and thank the Lord for the grace of you know, upfront shame and then forgiveness. And then, and then you do that for, for years. I mean, if you repent for years over and over again, you'll grow, you'll be cleansed, you'll mature, you'll become a better evangelist. Um, you'll have a list of regrets and then you'll say, but God's been so good to me. I don't deserve to be here. God's only ever been good to me. All of his gifts are pure. I have the best friends in the whole world. I think the most helpful passage for me for the attitude and the mode of evangelism has been 2 Timothy 2. And I'm paraphrasing here, but it talks about how we ought not to be about youthful passions, like quarreling. Instead, we should be teaching, instructing, correcting with long-suffering and patience and kindness, knowing that God may perhaps lead our opponents to the truth, to to repentance, um, coming to a knowledge of the truth. Um, having been ensnared by the devil. There's a lot there. It shows me that evangelism is a spiritual battle. And I'm talking with people who are under a dominion of, of a false king, of Satan. They're under a power. They're under a spirit. They're enslaved. They're blind. They need to be granted repentance. They're so dead. So I'm not in a mere intellectual battle or a war of words or a social engineering experiment. This isn't about um, tone policing in the end. It's just, you can't be slick enough to bring people into the kingdom. They're under slavery, they're blind, they need repentance, they need spiritual deliverance. 